I'm an attorney with North Penn Legal Services. Um, and um, I designed this um, I designed this training to serve as um, sort of a guide. Um, actually, I'll go. There you go. Um, as sort of a guide um, for advocates who are either new attorneys or um, more experienced attorneys who haven't necessarily practiced family law um, yeah. in the hope that this will uh, serve as a, enough foundational knowledge so that you will feel confident and comfortable taking on um, advice only or um, brief services uh, cases for clients who are going to be representing themselves in custody. Um, and we will talk a little bit of, at the end about um, determining uh, if and when to provide representation um, or other services um, like contacting a party or ghostwriting to certain clients. Um, we're going to discuss uh, interviewing the clients, um, getting the uh, information from them that you need to assess the case um, and provide them with the correct advice regarding both substance and procedure um, and preparing them to represent themselves in court. Um, and I tried to structure this in a way that sort of mirrors a client interview rather than just, you know, spewing out uh, information about custody laws and proceedings um, for you to try to memorize. There are plenty of resources out there that just give you the substance. Um, and you can pretty much just read the rules of civil procedure um, and the local rules if you want to know the proceedings. But I think that um, I'm hoping that this will help you to synthesize all of that information in a way that makes it easy to just go into a client interview and feel like you know what you're doing. Um, so first, we're going to talk about when we first get on the client call. Um, with a custody client, um, obtaining the information that we need from them, um, which is not always the information that they feel is most important to convey first. Um, there are three essential questions um, that you can look into first in order to get a, a pretty good idea of um, where you're at with the client right now um, and how to advise them. So the first question that you're going to want to ask whenever there's a custody case um, being assigned to you is if there is an existing custody order. Um, if there is, then ideally you want to see that order. Um, but you're going to want to know where it was issued um, and that's important because once an order is issued in a custody case, um, that jurisdiction has what's called continuing exclusive jurisdiction over the custody action um, until and unless the case is transferred elsewhere. Um, so knowing where the order was issued um, right off the bat can be helpful if it was issued in, you know, Virginia, then there's not much that you're, well, depending on the situation, there may not be much that uh, you can advise the client to do here. Um, the next question you're going to want to ask is who are the other parties? Um, I have made the mistake in the past, um, and especially early on, of assuming that the custody case was between uh, the two natural parents of the child. That is often not the case. Um, Sometimes uh, there are grandparents and step parents who are a party to the case. Um, often one of the natural parents is not even in the picture in the cases between one natural parent and a grandparent. Um, so uh, get a feel first for um, who else is involved. Um, you'll want to find out when the most recent existing order is from. Um, it could be something that was very recent, um, or it could be an order from 
you know, 15 years ago and the parties have been doing something else entirely for the past 14, um, besides what was actually outlined in the order. Um, and you'll want to know what the order provides for, um, what's the physical custody schedule, and who has legal custody, um, which I'll explain now. Um, so the physical custody schedule, physical custody is who has the care and control of the child. Um, and typically when lay people refer to custody and who has custody, um, this is what they're referring to. Uh, there are different forms of custody that can be ordered by the court. Um, sole physical custody uh, means that one party has the child all the time. Um, sometimes that term is used even when the other parent has uh, short periods of visitation, especially if the, the party with sole custody has discretion um, to allow or not allow those visits. Um, primary physical custody uh, is when a party has the child most of the time. Uh, partial is the flip side of primary. And shared physical custody is when both parties have significant periods. Um, some, a lot of lay people and even some professionals sometimes think that means it needs to be 50-50. Um, it doesn't. The statute simply says that both parties have significant periods of custody. Um, in practice, though, it's going to be probably close to 50-50, if not exactly. Um, there is no kind of bright line to um, determine whether a particular schedule is called uh, shared or um, whether it's called primary and partial. Um, and there are going to be judges and hearing officers who disagree on that, too. Um, not to mention, sometimes you can get a party to agree to a schedule that really is only partial custody if it's called shared custody, even though it's the same amount of time in practice. Um, so the one thing to know about shared physical custody, um, especially right now, is that the courts have been leaning more and more towards this being sort of a rebuttable presumption um, if there is not um, some sort of argument for doing things a different way or if another practice hasn't already been established between the parties of one parent being the primary caretaker. Um, now, who has legal custody um, is also important to determine, and a lot of lay people don't um, know what this is, so you'd be prepared to explain to your client. Um, legal custody is the right to be informed about and participate in uh, decisions, important decisions about the child's life. Um, and that can include um, what school to enroll the child in um, or, um, you know, decisions about uh, medical care, including vaccinations. That's been a hot topic. Um, spiritual decisions, uh, what church to take them to. Um, shared or joint legal custody is the norm um, that can lead to a lot of subsequent disputes in some cases, um, but sole legal custody is um, typically only granted if there's a good cause to do so. Um, usually if, um, well, if the other party doesn't uh, show up to a custody proceeding, um, but also if there are issues with um, an active um, substance abuse problem or um, severe mental health issues that would affect the party's ability to make decisions for the child. Um, and if there is no existing order, um, then you may want to move on to the other two of the big three questions first, um, but then you may need to ask some more questions to determine uh, a couple of preliminary matters. One would be jurisdiction. 
Um, if there is no existing order, then you need to figure out where the case does need to be brought. Now, if your client and the other party or parties and the child are all residing in the same county, then that's easy. Um, if the child is residing uh, with even just one of the parties in uh, the same county that they've been in for the past six months, then that's going to be uh, a simple determination that that is what is called their home state or home county. Um, it's if the child has been at their current residence for less than six months that um, these determinations can sometimes become uh, a little complicated. Um, if they were in a different state or county uh, within the last six months, then the action might need to be filed in that previous county unless um, neither or none of the parties still resides in that other county um, or unless there is an emergency basis um, for filing for custody in the new location. Um, there is a a provision in the custody statute that allows for um, victims of domestic violence to um, ask the court to grant emergency jurisdiction over the custody matter in the new location. Um, and then the court can grant uh, an order on a temporary emergency basis, um, during which time uh, the courts can talk to each other and the client can have the case moved um, or the victim can have the case moved to the new jurisdiction. Um, I'm not going to go too far into the weeds on this issue because you can do an entire day's training just on issues of jurisdiction and venue in custody cases. Um, and the determination is usually very fact specific. Um, so this is something where if it does come up in a consult with the client, um, it's almost always a good idea to let them know that you'll get back to them and do some research, um, run it by other knowledgeable colleagues um, and take it from there. Um, and you'll also want to know if there's no existing order, uh, what the practice has been of the parties, um, either since they have uh, been split, if, you know, frequently parties don't file a custody action immediately after the split. Sometimes you'll get a call from somebody who wants to file, and actually they've been just working things out outside of court for several years. Uh, before it went south and now they're not in agreement. So um, in that case, um, it is going to be important and relevant to the court's determination um, what the practice has been between the parties during that time. Um, if the split was very recent, then um, it's not as big of a, a as big of a consideration for the court, but um, you still will want to know um, how the child care responsibilities were divided while the parties were together, who is the primary caretaker. Um, and that will help to um, help to assess where the court might take that. Um, so once you have found out um, whether or not there's an existing order and the basic information about that. Um, you wanna delve into the client's current issue. In other words, why they're calling us for assistance. Um, the possible issues in custody are nearly endless, um, but you can usually uh, put the issue under one of three broad categories. Um, either another party in the case has filed something, um, and court is now pending on that, or the client herself has filed something, a complaint or a petition, um, or nothing has been filed yet and um, the client just has an objective and something they want to achieve in the case and they, they're not sure how to go about that. Um, and I think that this last scenario can be uh, the most intimidating um, if you're knowledge and experience of um, custody 
um, isn't that extensive. Uh, so we're actually going to start with that. And I think that that will kind of answer questions you might have in those first two situations as well. Um, so if nothing has been filed, um, you're going to listen to what it is that the client wants. Um, and based on that information, um, sometimes as well as whether there's an existing order or not, that will tell you what you need to file. Um, and so if there is no custody schedule in place or there is one, whether by court order or just agreement of the parties outside of court um, that isn't working for the client anymore and they need to change it, then they need to either file a custody complaint if there's no existing order or a petition for modification if there is. Um, if there is an existing order and the other party isn't following it, um, then the client needs to file a petition for contempt. Now, we often think of that in terms of not following the physical custody schedule, um, but there are all kinds of reasons why a contempt petition can be brought. Um, it, I've had a number of cases, especially recently, where um, my clients wanted to file for contempt for um, the other party not sharing information um, under an order where shared legal custody was granted. Um, and the client, you know, for instance, didn't have um, access to the child's doctors or medical information. And uh, one case where actually the other party wouldn't even provide the client with um, the child's birth certificate or social security number. So um, any provision that is included in the order, um, if it is violated, a contempt petition can be brought. Um, if the problem that the client is calling about is a disagreement regarding uh, a major issue, um, one of those issues that falls under the category of legal custody, then the client can file a petition for special relief. You can see where sometimes this goes hand in hand and you might have a situation where contempt and special relief are both appropriate. Um, they can be filed together. Um, and if they are filed together, it can be done as um, individual petitions or in one petition, um, which is usually what I usually opt to do it as one petition, but that's going to be, you know, personal preference. Um, if there is a disagreement between the parties regarding a major issue and there is no existing order, um, so there's no contempt if there's no existing order, um, but the um, obviously the natural parents both have the um, legal right to information about the child. Um, so they just need to get that in a court order and get it enforced. They would need to file a custody complaint in order to establish custody. Um, if it is an issue that is time sensitive in some way, um, which could happen if it's school enrollment. There were um, plenty of these when um, COVID vaccinations became um, a big issue of contention for a lot of clients. Um, a special relief petition, if it's something that needs to be resolved right away, can get you into, um, into court before a judge a lot sooner. Um, and we'll talk more about the procedures that are scheduled in these cases um, in a few minutes. If the client um, is looking to move um, from the immediate local area and there is an existing order, they're going to have to file what's called a notice of relocation um, and possibly also a modification if the move is going to necessitate a change in custody. Um, and that's going to depend on how far they're moving and what the current schedule is. Um, and if they are looking to move and there is no existing order, um, contrary to popular belief, um, 
the client does still need to file a notice of relocation, um, but they will need to file a custody complaint uh, contemporaneously in order to actually start the custody action since it doesn't exist yet. Um, now, some clients may choose not to file the notice of relocation uh, when they are moving, um, especially if there is no existing custody action. It's important to advise them in that case that, um, you know, that is their their choice, but um, should the other party object to the relocation and um, choose to take that objection to court, um, the client is going to be forced to travel back to the existing county, the home county, um, for the custody litigation going forward, um, which can be uh, expensive, inconvenient, sometimes impossible. Um, and so it might be a lot safer to actually file a relocation and litigate the issue uh, before moving. Um, if the client is not a parent um, and they're not otherwise a named party in an existing custody action, um, then they can file a petition to intervene um, in the custody action. Um, or if a grandparent or other third party has filed a petition to intervene or um, has started a custody action um, where they're trying to get custody of the child and the client objects, um, assuming that some argument can be made that the third party lacks standing, then preliminary objections would be what needs to be filed um, by the clients. Um, and finally, the, the biggest one, I think this is probably the bulk of uh, cases, at least that are assigned to me, are um, the other party is withholding the child from the client. So here, um, there could be a, um, a threat of immediate harm or detriment to the child's safety or well-being, which would um, necessitate the filing of an emergency petition for special relief. Um, and that's a filing that allows, it's, you know, presented usually in person to the judge in motions court, and it allows the judge to order ex parte relief um, to ensure the safety of the child. And then usually the hearing will be scheduled within a few days. Um, the if there is an existing order, then in addition to the emergency petition for special relief, the client can file a contempt petition, um, assuming that the current order is being violated by this withholding. Um, there are some custody orders where um, the terms of the actual periods of custody are left to, you know, by agreement of the parties, um, especially if they had been getting along very well previously. Um, so just in case you're wondering why a party could withhold a child um, and why that wouldn't be contempt where there's an existing order, sometimes the terms of the existing order are pretty loose when it comes to um, who has the child when. Um, if there's no existing order, um, they will need to also file a complaint in conjunction with the emergency petition. Um, the complaint is needed to start the custody action. Um, sometimes, um, actually I should probably clarify that uh, the threat of immediate harm um, an example of that would be that um, the party who's withholding the child is, um, you know, known to um, have an active drug addiction or um, an extensive and recent uh, history of violent crime or domestic violence, or the child has, you know, necessary medications that um, the other party doesn't have with them 
um, and with the child, um, or even that the child is absent from school if the child's supposed to be in school while this is happening. Um, and uh, the withholding party isn't taking them. Um, those are some examples of situations where um, you can make a pretty good case for an emergency order. Um, there are a lot of cases where um, as urgent as it feels to the client who's being deprived of time with the child, um, there really isn't an argument that can be made that there's any kind of immediate harm. And um, you'll have to kind of know what the practice is in your county um, if you want to um, provide the best advice regarding whether a petition for, um, well, what the time frame is going to be um, on a petition for special relief. Um, if you're in a county where it could be a couple months before the party gets into court, um, then you may want to file as an emergency petition, even if you think the case for it is pretty weak. Um, and well, I will um, come back to that in a little bit, but a uh, petition for contempt um, can be filed again if there is an existing order. Um, if there's no existing order, then really the only thing to file is a custody complaint um, unless the client wants to file a petition for special relief again, which is basically just to get before a judge sooner. Um, and then the last, the third question to ask um, when you first get the case and start interviewing the client is if there's anything currently pending before the court. So if there has already been something filed by either the client or the other side, um, then this will tell you what should be scheduled um, and coming up for the court. Um, so if anybody filed a complaint, a uh, petition for a modification of an existing custody order or notice of relocation, then the court will schedule the case for first a conciliation conference. And then if there is um, no agreement, it would be scheduled for a hearing or a trial. If the dispute is over partial custody um, or sometimes a minor ancillary issue, it can be scheduled for a record hearing. Some counties will use hearing officers, also known as custody masters for this. Um, and other counties, especially very small counties, might just have a judge doing everything. Um, but in all counties, if the dispute is regarding shared primary or sole physical custody, or um, if it's a termination of legal custody, then it has to go to a trial uh, before a judge. Um, if a petition for contempt or special relief or a petition to intervene is filed, it would be scheduled for a hearing before a judge. And again, if there's an emergency petition for special relief, um, it will be a hearing, but there should be a shorter time frame um, if ex parte relief was granted, um, because that means that the rights of the party who has not been heard yet have been affected. Um, but I underline should because um, custody courts are often really backed up um, and may not schedule things as quickly as they should. Um, and then we sometimes have clients who don't call us until after the proceeding already occurred um, or at the last minute and we're not actually able to get in contact with them until after the proceeding has occurred. Um, and so they would, um, you'd want to be in a position where you can tell them uh, what's going to happen next. Um, if they attended a conciliation conference and there was no agreement, then a record hearing or a trial is going to be scheduled. Um, if a record hearing did occur, um, 
And then you can let them know that the hearing officer is going to be sending a report and recommendation with a proposed order, um, which may also be labeled an interim order. Uh, the parties will have 20 days to file exceptions to that order um, if they want to challenge it. Um, and it will be scheduled for argument before a judge. This is not a rehearing. Um, it's really an argument based on the evidence that was presented at the record hearing. And um, the judge will then issue a final order after that argument. Um, or if there are no exceptions filed, a final order would be issued. Um, if a hearing or trial occurred um, and there, or there has otherwise been a final order issued, then the client can file a motion for reconsideration um, and um, they can file, or they can file an appeal. Um, appeals are somewhat, in my experience, they're somewhat infrequent in custody. And I think this is because you can kind of always go back to custody court and it's often easier and quicker and cheaper um, to just file something else at the common pleas level, like a petition for modification. Um, but the client will need to show if they want to do a modification to try to change the outcome that there has been a change in some facts or circumstances since the court made the last determination. Um, and okay. And so this is a, a practice tip, but I want to stop here for a second to see if, um, if anybody has any questions so far? Nothing's come up in the chat, Diane. Thank you, Tim, I appreciate that. Um, so if there is an existing order in the case, um, or if there's been anything filed very recently um, that is the basis for the client's call, um, you should try to get a copy of that to review um, as early on as possible. Um, and this is because um, clients often don't have uh, a really strong handle on custody terminology um, or custody procedures, and they often provide um, information that may not be correct or complete regarding their case. And sometimes this information completely changes um, your the advice that you would give them. Um, so, you know, I've had situations where, you know, clients told me that, um, you know, somebody filed a petition for, that the other side filed a petition for a modification of custody. Um, and I advised them about the conciliation conference and different forms of custody and the whole process, um, only to learn later that the other party had not filed a petition for modification, but instead had con had filed a petition for um, civil contempt for disobedience of a custody order. So there was no conciliation conference scheduled. It was a hearing. Um, so the procedure is different. The substantive advice about the arguments the client should make are different. The relief that's going to be granted is different. Um, and then you kind of have to start over again and you've wasted a lot of time. So um, I do recommend reviewing the actual document, even if the client thinks that they um, can tell you what it says. Um, and once you have all of this basic information that we've discussed, um, that's really going to help you to ascertain what further information you want to get from your client regarding the specific facts of their case. Um, and if there's any more that you need to know from them in order to um, start giving them advice on how to proceed. So, um, Diane, before you start yeah. here, I'm going to launch yeah. a poll for the CLE. Um, I'll leave it up for a couple minutes. So those of you who are here for CLE credit, please respond. 
Otherwise, you can respond no, and um, the CLE poll will clear off. Okay. Um... So um, I'm going to go through some of the substantive information um, to provide clients with, depending on their situation. Um, so this is going to cover the, the best interest of the child standard and uh, 16 custody factors um, that you may be familiar with or have heard of. The standard to be applied by the court for specific um, filings or issues um possible substantive arguments and um outcomes so in all custody matters um the court is looking at what is in the best interest of the child um and that is actually written into the statute in a couple places but i think the first and main place um is listed here um the award of custody is also made based on 16 factors um, that are supposed when analyzed are supposed to shed light on what is in the best interest of the child. Um, I'm I did not list the 16 factors here because um, again, I feel like um there, I mean, you could easily look it up and there are a lot of custody trainings out there that um that list them. And if you do have a client who is heading to a, a trial or hearing where there's going to be a broad final determination of physical custody, um, then you're likely going to want to review those 16 factors with your clients um, so that you can help them to analyze those in the context of the specific facts of their case. Um, if that is not where their case is headed, if it's on a more narrow issue, like a contempt hearing, then the 16 factors aren't going to be helpful. And I wouldn't provide them because you might just, um, confuse them. But, um, the one thing that I, I would like to do is just talk about a couple of broad principles that are sort of baked into the factors, um, one is the facilitation of relationships between the child and other family members. Um, and that does include the other party, um, but also extended family, siblings. Um, the court does want to see the child being, um, uh, being able to connect with ideally both or all the parties involved in the custody action, as well as their other family members, um, both immediate and extended. Um, the court also places a high priority on the safety and stability of the child, um, both physical and emotional. Um, and there is also within the factors, even though it's not explicitly stated, um, there is some degree of preference for preservation of the status quo. Um, for instance, one of the factors has to do with who has been um, the primary caretaker of the minor child to this point. Um, and so it is helpful um, to a party's case if they have been the primary caretaker previous, previously, um, if they are seeking primary custody now. Um, it's certainly not dispositive, but the court does like to um, keep things somewhat the same. Um, and a lot of courts and a lot of judges will try to avoid making a huge shift all at once unless it's necessary for um, the health and well-being of the child. So... I'm just going to go over some of the specific types of filing or issues and, and the standards. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but I did want to include this because I'm hoping that after this training, these slides can serve as sort of like a cheat sheet for 
um, helpline calls and for advising clients. So um, if the issue is contempt, um, then what the petitioner needs to show is that there has been willful noncompliance with the custody order. So um, if, for instance, they want to file for contempt because the other party did not bring the child to the exchange location um, for the client's visit last week, then it is important to to know why. Um, and sometimes you can't know why. And so you can absolutely file for contempt and make the other side prove that um, they couldn't get there for some reason, right? Um, but if, for instance, um, the other party didn't make it to the exchange location with the child because um, they were very ill and had landed in the hospital or even something less dramatic than that, um, for instance, they, you know, didn't have a uh, something happened to their car and they didn't have transportation to get to the exchange location, um, then as long as they were, um, you know, communicating with the other party as required, then there may not be any contempt because the, com the non-compliance may not be willful. Um, if the party is found in contempt, um, if there was willful non-compliance, then the judge will typically give them the opportunity to purge the contempt by complying with a new order. So the most common um, instance of contempt is uh, missed visits or missed time with the child. And what's usually ordered in that case is makeup time. So the judge will say that, you know, if the violating party complies in giving the other party makeup time for the missed time, then the contempt will be purged. Um, special relief. Um, there is no statutory standard for special relief. Um, it's really not in the statutes. It's in the, in the rules and that just regard, regards the relief the court can grant. Um, so we kind of already discussed the, um, the issue of immediate harm and that you can file the emergency petition and let the court make a determination. Um, if you file it as an emergency petition and the court determines it's not an emergency, usually they'll just deny the ex parte relief and um, schedule it for a hearing. So it's basically treated as a, a petition for special relief that's not an emergency. Um, but I have had cases, one judge in particular, who um, in this situation has treated the emergency petition as a petition to, for a modification of a custody order. Um, and that may depend on the circumstances or the relief that the party is asking for. Um, the issues that can be raised and the relief that can be sought in special relief petitions is um, almost limitless. Um, so there's not too much that that we can discuss here. It's going to be very fact specific. Um, but it is important to remember that the safety of the child and again, the best interest of the child are always paramount. Um, relocation. Um, there is a lot on relocation. And this is another one of those topics that could be an entire day's training um, or longer. Um, but uh, if you're just advising a client on a call um, uh, on how to represent themselves, then it is pretty easy to um, to review the information that you would want to provide to them. Uh, most of it is contained in the statute that governs relocation, um, including uh, 10 factors that the court needs to consider uh, in a relocation case. Um, now, if the relocation will require a change in custody, then those, those 16 factors, the 16 custody factors that we discussed before, will also have to be analyzed by the court. Um, and there is some overlap in those. Um, 
So you'd want to go over those factors with the client and also how those apply to the specific facts of their case. Um, but the general principle that you'd want to emphasize to the client over everything else is that they want to demonstrate why the move is going to be beneficial for the child in some way. Um, for instance, the move will put the child in a much better school district or um, the parent has a job offer in this other um, in this other location um, that is going to be uh, much more lucrative and provide uh, an improved standard of living for the child. Um, Another example is the party may have uh, a lot of extended family and friends and a big support system in the other location. Um, and um, I, so, and it's not included here, but if you don't know if a move is a relocation, um, generally, again, you're going to look at the statute, which um, uh, provides that uh, a relocation is when a, a party moves um, uh, to a new location that is, I don't have it in front of me and I'm not sure how it's worded, but basically it needs to um, impact um, the ability of the other party to exercise custody of the child um, and maintain their relationship with the child. Um, so as a general rule, if it's a different county that the party is moving to, then it's going to be a relocation. And there have been, uh, cases, at least in Luzerne County, where a move from one far end to the other far end of the county was determined by the court to constitute a relocation. Um, if the matter before the court is a petition to intervene or otherwise a, an issue of standing, um, then there are a couple statutes that speak to that issue. Um, one of them governs any form of physical custody as well as legal custody of the child. Um, and that provides for um, that a parent has standing as does a person who stands in loco parentis or a grandparent if certain conditions are met. Um, a person standing in loco parentis is, that just means somebody who has been um, standing in the shoes of a parent, acting as the child's parent. Um, it can infrequently, it can be infrequently is a step parent, but it doesn't have to be that sort of situation. Um, it is important to note that just because an adult has been living in the same household as a child that does not automatically confer in loco parentis status. Um, they will have to make an argument as to the parental duties that they have performed, um, been performing for a substantial time um, that put them in the position of a parent. Um, and then there are also specific conditions where a grandparent can petition for any form of physical custody, um, which um, they're sort of specific in rare cases. I don't expect everybody to remember this. I think if you get a case um, where this is an issue, you're you're probably going to want to look up the the statute and review it. Um, even those of us who do a lot of custody cases can sometimes be thrown off by these. Um, but if the parent of the child who is the grandparent, if the parent of the child who is the grandparent's child um, is deceased or if um, the parents uh, don't have any uh, kind of uh, control over the children, um, care and control, um, typically that subsection is used when there are um, uh, active um, substance abuse problems uh, 
involving both of the parents. Um, and it overlaps with the third um, condition, which is if there's a dependency case um, that has been opened um, that would allow the grandparent also to seek um, any form of physical custody as well as legal custody of the child. Um, and then there is another statute that allows for grandparents or great grandparents to seek partial physical custody only. Um, and again, that's typically um, in a case where there is um, a party, a parent who is deceased or um, the parents uh, have an active um, custody case already, and there's a disagreement between the parents as to whether the grandparents should be allowed to have regular visits or contact. Um, the grandparents can then intervene to seek partial custody. Um, but I do recommend looking over the statute and the details of each of these in any situation where um, this is the issue that the client is calling about. Um, so whatever type of case it is, um, you know, remember the whole Iraq method in law school um, and applying your analysis to specific facts. Um, clients often don't really know how to do that. So you want to explain the legal standard to them, but you especially want to explain how it applies to the specific facts of their case um, in a way that you can tell that they understand and they're going to be able to uh, make that argument on their own. Um, you'll want to frame the, the argument that the client is trying to make um, in light of the best interest of the child standard, um, you know, sometimes the reasons why the client wants a thing um, may not be the best reasons for them to present to the court. Um, as an example, I once had a case where um, there had been a previous custody trial. Um, Dad was our client. But, um, and at the trial, mom had um, been asked by the judge uh, why it was that she wanted primary custody of the child in question, um, or why she should have, pardon me, why she should have primary custody of the child in question. And the mom answered, um, because he has other kids and I only have this one. Um, so I guess it just seems to her that it would be unfair that he would also have custody of this child. Keep in mind that the court doesn't really care uh, all that much about what may be or may not be fair to the parties. It's about what's good for the child. Um, you'll want to advise the, the client regarding what, what facts that they've given you or which points are most helpful to their case and that they should focus on. Um, sometimes the particular points that they're really preoccupied with um, are not necessarily the things that they should focus on um, when they're in front of the judge or the hearing officer if they want to get the best outcome. Um, and so you may need to coach them a little bit about um, you know, what is the most helpful and why, um, because if they understand why, then they're far more likely to remember. Um, and the way that the, um, that the proceeding is conducted, um, often custody proceedings can be somewhat informal, um, and the judge may simply ask the part, especially if both parties are pro se, right? The judge might just ask questions of both of the parties um, and may not give them a ton of time to answer those questions or to uh, give a narrative of their side of the case. Um, so you do want to make sure that you explain to the client that it is important for them to 
um, take note of these particular points that support their argument the best and try to raise them and try to do it relatively quickly, um, you know, early on in the hearing because they may not have the chance to talk as long as they want to. Um, and then after having this discussion with them, uh, I recommend following up with an email or an advice letter uh, that references what you discussed um, that the client can then reference to review before their court date. Um, and the final um, substantive topic um, that we're going to discuss is outcomes. Um, the relief that is um, being requested and possible alternatives. Um, obviously, different forms of physical custody and legal custody are the most commonly requested and granted forms of relief in custody court. Um, they don't really require any um, explanation as to what they are. Um, so I did want to go over some of the other things that the courts commonly order um, that can serve both as remedies um, and as tools for the court to um, continue to assess the case and make further determinations in the future. Um, so one thing that they can order and frequently do when there's a safety concern regarding a party is um, supervision. Um, a party's periods of partial custody can be required to be supervised um, either by a court um, court approved supervisor um, or sometimes just by a, a friend or family member um, who is willing and able to supervise the visits. Um, the practice for this, again, may vary by the county. The availability of um, professional supervisors certainly does vary by county. Some counties actually have um, free supervision available to um, parties um, who are ordered to have supervised contact. Um, those can often be limited though, and may not be desirable. Um, if for instance, uh, Lackawanna County has, a, a program that will provide, uh, professional supervision for visits, but it's, there's a waiting list usually, um, and they'll only do an hour a week. So, um, frequently, a friend or relative, if they're available, um, can be a more, um, well, it's certainly more affordable and easier option. Um, there are professional supervisors um, who charge. You can get them for more time, uh, but most of our clients, um, I would even say most people, couldn't afford to use them for any significant length of time. Um, it's usually here in Luzerne County, about $50 an hour. Um, and it, you know, obviously it can be higher or lower depending on your location, but it gets pretty steep over a period of time. Um, this can be useful to the court though, because a lot of these professional supervisors will submit a report to the court about how the visits went. Um, it can be a useful tool if, your client is the one who has to be supervised because those reports are generally positive um, because obviously the party who's being supervised is going to try to be on their best behavior uh, while they're doing supervised visits. Um, and often it's a situation where the child hasn't been able to have a lot of contact with that party lately um, and they're often very excited to spend time with them so the reports from the supervisors um, that i've seen have the vast majority of them have been very positive and helpful helpful to the party who was supervised um, on the flip side if um if your client is the one who wants the other party to be supervised, uh, you may want to give them a heads up that 
um, if they get a professional supervisor, if there's a positive re report uh, from that supervisor, as there is very likely to be, um, then it's very possible that the court is going to shift uh, that party from supervised visits to unsupervised visits, um, or perhaps using a third party after that report is issued. Um, the court can also issue a mental, I'm sorry, order a mental health evaluation. Um, typically, the court will provide that the party needs to be assessed by a counselor and follow any recommended treatment. Um, this isn't something obviously that can just be requested and ordered willy nilly, but if there is, um, if there are facts to support that a mental health evaluation might be um, required or helpful in a case, um, it's not too uncommon for the court to order this. Um, in this case though, there is not typically a report issued to the court. Um, what you do see more often is um, a letter from the counselor stating that, uh, you know, so-and-so had a um, uh, requested and participated in an evaluation um, and was not, either was not recommended for further therapy at this time, or they were recommended for continued therapy and they have been complying. Um, and the party will obtain that letter um, to show the court that they're in compliance with this requirement, um, but it doesn't provide any information to the court or the other party. Um, there are mental health evaluations out there that can, that can be ordered um, where a report to the court is issued. It's, you know, forensic mental health evaluation. Um, these, I, it has happened once or twice, but they should actually not be covered by insurance um, because they're not done for the purpose of treatment. Um, and when they're not covered by insurance, they can be very expensive. Um, usually, a, I think the cheapest they can be done around here is $1,500 and they go up from there. Um, so that's not done as commonly, but I have seen them done and been covered by insurance. Um, family counseling can also be ordered. Um, in this case, um, there is typically a report issued um, for the court about how the counseling has been going. Um, family counseling can take several different forms uh, in family court. Co-parenting counseling is probably the most common, um, especially when there is a rocky relationship between the parties. Um, reunification counseling can be ordered between the child and a parent, um, either because they have previously been estranged for some time or because there are just uh, some sort of issues um, between them. Um, sometimes there's a child who doesn't, states a, um, a reluctance to spend time with a parent um, and doesn't want to go when it's time to have visits. Um, in those cases, the court will sometimes order reunification counseling to sort through those things. Um, and sometimes the court can and will order all family members to participate as recommended by the counselor. Um, and in that case, the children and the parents um, are all typically assessed individually by the counselor first, and then the counselor will determine um, who and in what combinations needs to return. If there should be co-parenting co counseling done, um, if children need to come in with a particular parent or both parents, um, and then they'll issue a report to the court about what they determined is the, you know, the best course of action um, and the progress that's been made. Um, not all uh, mental health professionals or family counselors 
are the same and the amount of detail that's included in these reports um, can certainly vary. Um, but most of the reports that um, that I've gotten and seen in my cases have a lot of detail that can be really useful in custody cases um, going forward. Um, so this can be really helpful. They will usually be very careful not to make any recommendation uh, regarding custody for a number of reasons, probably mostly legal, um, but they still provide uh, a ton of detail and background regarding, um, you know, the the stated feelings of different parties and uh, their behavior, their progress, their interactions with each other. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, a guardian ad litem can also be appointed to advocate for the child's best interest. Um, and they will interview pretty much everybody in the child's life and also issue a very detailed report and recommendation to the court. So um, unlike most of the counselors, they will make a recommendation. It's part of their job. Um, this can be useful in cases um, where the child may be younger and not necessarily um, going to be interviewed by the judge directly. <laughs> Um, but you would still want to get there. Um, and I, I see that I forgot to finish the word interview there. Um, but yeah, if the child is younger and maybe not old enough for the judge to interview directly and you still want to have their, um, their perspective and their thoughts and feelings heard by the court, the guardian ad litem is a way to get that in. Um, their rates can can be quite expensive, um, but you can petition for a special IFP for that purpose. Um, some counties just kind of, as a blanket rule, don't do it. Um, in other counties, it is easier to get it granted. Um, and so you can see what the county that you practice in does and if that might be an option if you have a good case for it. Um, the court can also order drug and alcohol assessments. Um, the assessments that I've seen done all rely on self-reporting, so their value is pretty limited. Um, but if the issue is with alcohol, there may not really be another avenue um, to try to get evidence of that before the court. Um, there is drug testing available. What specific services are available are going to depend on the county, um, as well as the cost and how that works. Um, the counties that I deal with have all done um, mobile drug testing services where uh, the techs actually come to the court, usually within an hour of the request being made and granted by the court so that nobody leaves and has the chance to try to cheat it in any way. Um, they're instructed to just wait there for the tech to come and take the sample. Um, so, but those logistics can vary depending on the county. Um, sometimes um, the parties may be ordered to, you know, go and submit to a drug test within a given amount of time. Um, if it's a hair follicle test, they're a lot harder to cheat and they go back a lot further in time. Um, so those can be better to order, um, especially in those cases, but um, just be aware of the cost and also what the common practice is in your county for covering that. Um, typically in my experience, the party who is requesting the drug test for the other party is the one who usually has to pay it. Um, but that's not a hard and fast rule and you can make an argument to shift that cost to the other party. Um, but yeah, just keep the cost in mind, especially if you ask for a hair follicle test. Um, if the client's going to be responsible for that, if they're able to cover it, um, and if they are, it would have to be provided on the day that you request it. Um, if you are in a place where mobile testing is used on site.
Um, so this takes us to the next next section. Um, I realize this is a two hour training. I don't know if I'm supposed to break for a couple minutes or not. Should I just keep going? All right, Tim's not answering me, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, so does anybody have any questions before I continue though? Sorry, Diane, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, okay. I was uh, on mute. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's okay. Should should I like take five or should I just keep going straight through? I think uh, you could go straight through. Okay. Um, so, all right. So that was the substantive information that you want to provide to the client. Um, and, you know, with most things, with just about anything, um, if you're not totally sure on something while you're talking to the client, um, you can pretty easily look it up. Um, and that's why I provided the, um, the statutory citations for the different actions, um, because they're pretty easy to reference. Um, the procedural advice now can get a little bit trickier. Um, and this is information that you will sort of have to follow up on your own in your um, particular county of practice um, because there is a lot of procedure in custody cases that is governed by local rules um, and also local practice that hasn't been codified in writing. Mm -hmm. um, so you do wanna learn your local procedures. Um, but we will discuss some broader kind of universal, hopefully universal uh, procedures for conferences and hearings, um, and then how the client can prepare for court. Um, so the local procedures um, are often summarized in some fashion on the county's website, um, even if it's just a collection of pro se custody forms, um, sometimes with instructions and or other information. Um, so find out what your local county has, um, familiar, familiarize yourself with their forms, um, and also what they charge fees for. Um, remember, most of our clients will need to petition for an IFP if there is a fee. Um, usually the only fee um, filing fee for custody is to start the action, but there are some counties that charge a fee for a modification. Um, so just know what your county does. Um, and you'll want to also learn how and where and when to file. Um, some counties um, have electronic filing or just simply by sending an email to a certain email address. Uh, Sometimes, um, especially if there is an IFP being requested, uh, certain things will have to be presented at motions court by the client. Uh, sometimes the client will need to just drop something off in person. Um, so learn how that's done in the county where you practice or what the different options are. Um, and also know whether they use um, hearing officers um, which that's what they're called in the rules of civil procedure. Now they were formally called custody masters. And there are a lot of, um, a lot of people who still use the term custody master just because it's been so deeply ingrained. Um, but as I said before, not every County uses them. Sometimes there's just a judge. Um, so that's a piece of information that you'll want to obtain. Um, and then also, speak to one of your colleagues who does a lot of custody cases to find out about the time frames. They can vary pretty widely by county as well. And sometimes that information is pretty crucial. Um, in Luzerne County, for instance, when a client goes to a conciliation conference, um, if there's no agreement, if it's a dispute about partial custody um, or otherwise something that the hearing officer has the authority to decide, 
um, then the, they will turn on the recording equipment and go right into a record hearing then and there. So um, that's really important to know when you're advising clients in Luzerne County um, because they need to actually have witnesses with them and be prepared to go into a formal hearing um, when they go to the conciliation conference. Um, so details like that can be very important. Um, now at the conciliation conference stage, um, there is no record created or formal testimony. It's just um, the hearing officer or in some cases the judge trying to facilitate an agreement uh, between the two parties. Um, but uh, I think sometimes it can be important to emphasize to the client that that doesn't mean that it isn't important. Um, and in fact, sometimes it's the same judge or hearing officer who's going to be making a determination after a contested hearing. Um, and this might be the first uh, or most significant impression that they have gotten of the case itself or the parties involved. Um, and so it can be a really good chance um, for the client to present themselves and their case in the best light um, to affect the outcome. Um, and it can also be a situation where, you know, things they say, even though a record isn't created, can really come back to bite them later on. Um, so it is a very important proceeding, um, even though it's only a conference. Um, and even if no agreement is reached, um, it's also an opportunity for the client to gain some information that may be useful to them at the next proceeding, um, including whether the other party uh, is represented at this time, um, what arguments or defenses they are making um, regarding the issue that's being heard, and also um, to get a sense of how the court is leaning. Um, obviously, that's especially true if it's going to be decided by the same person. Um, but also, you know, there are some general principles and sometimes common practices or even common um, uh, often uh, the the hearing officers and judges in a county will sort of be on the same page when it comes to uh, certain issues or problems. And so even if it isn't the same person who's gonna be deciding the case ultimately, it can be informative to find out how receptive um, this hearing officer or judge is in um, the client's arguments and the other sides. Um, if the client's headed for a hearing, then you're going to want to explain the structure of the hearing to the client. Um, this should be pretty easy, regardless of what area of law you have experience in. Um, a lot of clients don't really know anything about the basic structure of what occurs, so you'll want to explain to them you know, that the petitioner puts on their case first and then the respondent gets to respond. Um, talk to them about um, witnesses and testimony um, and cross-examination, um, maybe. Um, that doesn't always happen when you're dealing with two pro se litigants, um, but I would at least advise the client of the possibility that the other party may be permitted to ask them questions. Um, and just at least so they're aware of that, especially if you're dealing with a case where there's been um, a lot of emotions running high um, so that they can be prepared for it mentally. Um, and you can talk to them about um, entering documents into evidence, um, let them know to try to have three copies of anything that they want to enter. Um, you can talk to them about the child's interview, which I'll get to in a second, um, and also that the judge may 
issue a decision um, then and there at the end of the hearing, or they may say that you have to wait for an order to come later. Um, so the child interview that I just alluded to, um, that may or may not take place. So there are a ton of different factors that will affect whether the court is going to interview the child in a particular proceeding. Um, so the county practice is obviously relevant, um, but in a county with multiple judges, it may depend on the individual judge and their preference. Um, the child's age, um, and those two things aren't independent of each other. There are certain judges who might draw a sort of bright line at a certain age, um, and then other judges don't. Um, and then the type of proceeding matters, as well as the specific facts. Um, kind of skipping to the bottom now for a second, but if if facts that are crucial to the case um, are not otherwise going to come in at the hearing, um, if the child is not able to testify, for instance, there could be an allegation of physical abuse um, by one parent against the child for which nobody else was present. Um, the child is gonna be the only person besides the accused parent who can testify to the court about what happened. Um, so that would be a situation um, that would certainly increase the likelihood of a child interview. Um, older children are obviously more likely to be interviewed than younger children, but again, the exact cutoff ages vary. Um, and in terms of the type of proceeding, um, if it's a full trial on the merits, if there's, or even just a hearing on the merits of a general custody proceeding, general custody schedule, um, the court is far more likely to interview the child than it would be um, if there was, a, if it's a contempt hearing um, or a special relief hearing on a very narrow issue. Um, there are some attorneys um, and presumably some courts who believe that it's reversible error to um, to not do a child interview if the child is if it's a full trial and the child is of an age where um, where their testimony is reliable and credible. Um, so those are all different factors to consider. Um, the interview of the child uh, can, under the rules of civil procedure, take place in open court. Um, I've never seen a judge interview a child in open court. Um, that being said, it's not like I've been doing this forever. It's been about five, little over five years that I've been doing custody, but um, and also in very limited counties, there may be, it may be common practice in some counties around the state, but um, in my experience, it's um, pretty much always done in chambers, um, but it is on the record. Um, the court reporter will be in the chambers with the judge and the child. Um, I forgot to put on the slide that the, the parties um, and even the attorneys may be excluded um, from the interview. Um, and that again, depends on the, the practice of the county and the individual judge. Um, in my experience, the parties are uh, nearly always excluded. Um, sometimes the attorneys are permitted to be present in the room, um, but either way, the parties or their attorneys do have the ability, if they're not allowed to be present, to submit questions to the judge um, for the judge to optionally um, ask the child during the child interview. Um, and even though the interview is on the record, um, the access to it may be limited. 
Um, for instance, I know in Luzerne County, they will not release the transcripts of a child interview unless an appeal is filed, um, which can make a lot of things very difficult if nobody was allowed in the room um, and there are future proceedings and nobody knows why a certain decision was made. Um, but that is what the court is permitted to do. Um, and so we talked about substance and procedure, but some of the advice that I think is most important to give clients, especially for something like custody, which is often not about any kind of complex legal arguments, but really just the facts and presenting them in the most favorable light. Um, I think it can be most important to give them some very practical um, skills advice and preparation tips. So first, I think it's important to um, make sure the client understands that like this is not the be all and end all, even if it is a full trial. Um, no, I always like to say that no order in custody is final. There is such thing as a final order in custody, but um, but there's really not because things can always change um, until the child becomes an adult. Um, and there are custody cases that do remain pretty active in custody court for uh, the duration of the child's childhood. Um, but situations can change and shift and a party may lose custody um, and then might get it back um, several months later. Um, so even if the worst case scenario occurs um, in court, I always try to assure the client that, um, you know, there there's always a path that can be taken to try to get closer to their goal. So I think it's important to look not just at the client's short-term objectives, but also their long-term objectives. Um, and to put the upcoming proceeding um, in perspective and in the context of um, in the context of the long term and what they would ultimately like to have with the child. Um, and then beyond that, um, it is also important to have the client get into the nitty gritty of the details of what it is that they want, um, because these issues are going to be a hearing officer who has to um, order a schedule between two parties. Um, whether they're negotiating a schedule between them or ordering one after a hearing, they don't know um, when it comes to the party's work schedules and availability of transportation um, or what holidays are important to them. Um, these things are all going to be um, dependent on specific facts that are known to the clients. Um, and to the other party. So they can really help their case by having um, all of the details of what they would ideally want uh, written down and laid out for the court. Um, there are some places where a parenting plan um, or some version of this is included with the custody complaint. So it's already in front of the court. Um, but there are other places like my home county where um, nothing like this is provided to the client ahead of time. And so they may not have even really thought about the details um, of what they want before they go to the custody conference if they don't get advice um, from an attorney. So other than saying like, you know, for instance, the client says they want 50-50 custody. Well, OK what schedule do you want? Um, so it's important for them to um, to write down um, whether they wanna do a week on week off schedule or um, some other arrangement um, of what days and times would be ideal for them. And then also not just what their ideal is, but also 
what's possible for them based on their schedule um, and what they absolutely cannot do. Um, and the same is true when it comes to transportation and logistics. Um, sometimes only one party has a driver's license or a vehicle. Um, and these issues can get pretty hairy. Um, the court will usually try to split the responsibility of transportation between the parties, um, but that's not that's not always the case depending on the parties. Uh, behavior and time with the child. Um, and then holidays and vacation time um, can be a very contentious issue and difficult for the parties to work out. But the client is more likely to get something that they're happy with if they go into the conference or hearing um, prepared with very specific things that they want. Um, so they should ideally have everything written down so that they can reference it when they go into court. Um, and certainly they should be at least prepared to answer questions about what they want. Um, and then um, it may be helpful to discuss evidence with the client. Um, we already discussed applying the legal standard to the client specific facts and what points are the most important for the client to get in front of the court. Um, but it might be helpful to talk to the client about how those facts get before the court. Um, if there is anything that's gonna come in outside of their own testimony. Um, if there are other witnesses or if there's documentary evidence available, um, then you can analyze together whether that may be useful, um, if there are any facts about which the client lacks personal knowledge um, that might otherwise be hearsay, then it can be important to um, have another witness present or um, another witness or a document might be helpful to corroborate the client's testimony um, if there are facts that are likely to be disputed. Um, and then practical pointers for the client. Um, I always advise them to take some written notes with them um, because so often clients get nervous and then forget what it was that they wanted to say once they're actually in front of the judge. Um, I usually advise them to speak slowly and clearly, even though I don't always take my own advice. Um, and based on your own conversation with the client, there may be other advice that you want to give them, sometimes um, tailored to their individual personality um, or concerns or issues communicating. Um, and that, I think, is also pretty universal whenever we're advising pro se litigants. Um, but I think that these things make that much more difference when you're in kind of such a gray area of the law um, where there isn't so much substantive legal argument and the impression that the court gets of the client and of the merits of their case really matters. Um, so that covers really the client interview. Um, the last section has to do with determining the scope of services. Um, but I wanna ask again, if anybody has any questions um, and also if anybody has, um, you know, any feedback about how uh, their county might do some of these things differently, um, if different than what I stated. Hi, uh, yeah, this yes. is Tim Kahn Walker. I, I do have a quick question for you. Um, I uh, put it on the chat as well, but I think you said you can't see the chat. Um, I had a client at one time that um, was very concerned about child support and the implications on her child support uh, based upon the custody arrangement that may have been agreed upon, uh, and, you know, the amount of time that she has a child versus her ex-husband having the child. Um, 
And I, I was wondering, what is your thought on how best to advise a client um, on the proper custody arrangement when a really big part of it is the needed child support? Yeah, um, well, that's a tricky one in a lot of ways um, because it is so crucial um, to so many clients. Um, and yet, um, in my experience, the judges in custody court don't generally want to hear anything about child support, um, not to mention they'll often hold it against a party if they believe that child support is a consideration in what the party is asking for in regards to custody. Um, so, I mean, I think the most important thing is to make sure that the client is aware of that um, because, you know, you don't want them necessarily going before the judge and arguing that, you know, they should have this custody schedule because they don't want to pay child support. Um, however, um, and sometimes that may be all you can do is just make sure that they're aware of it and they're going to make the best argument. Um, now, that being said, um, they should be aware of just some of the basics of child support, um, which I'm not really, I, we don't handle child support here. Um, I have handled some of it in the past, um, but um, let me just, let me just clarify. So your client is the one who's paying child support? No, she was receiving the child support and she was concerned okay. that if she gave up too much uh, time to her, uh, to her ex-husband, she would, yeah. a, a child support she would receive would significantly right. go down. Right. 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 Um, right. And, and, you know, depending on the amount of time, you know, at some point that would happen. Right. Um, now there is, it does have to be a certain amount of time before any change is actually effectuated. And so, you know, you could, uh, look at the child support guidelines and um, figure out the number of uh, overnights annually that the client has now um, and then determine, um, you know, if they gave up uh, a certain amount of overnights, you know, at what point does that shift the child support obligation um, right. just so that they're aware. Um, but really, it, the, you know, child support can be the the reason why they want to maintain primary physical custody. That's obviously not the reason they're going to argue to the court. So I would, you know, talk to them in depth about their situation and the facts of their case um, and find uh, arguments based on the best interest of the child and the 16 factors that supports them retaining primary custody, uh, because those are the arguments that the court's going to want to hear. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Dan, yeah, just in the comments, um, Wendy noted that uh, you know, the payer parent's got to exercise 40% or more overnight to start to receive a reduction. Right. And so um, that's kind of the figure to look at. Um, there might be some other expenses and things like that that, that, that are factored in there as well. Um, I'm going to yeah, yeah. launch the second um, CLE poll. Well, uh, paused here. If there's other questions, people can feel free to ask. Are there no other questions before we go to the scope of services? Okay. I'll I will open it up again at the end uh, for more questions or discussion. Um, and this section of my PowerPoint kind of got uh, the short shrift, I think maybe the last slide. No, I have important resources after this. Um, but I do think that it's important to discuss at least briefly. Um, now in with legal aid organizations, 
we all have, you know, case priorities that are um, decided and set forth by the organization. Um, and so obviously those case priorities are going to be, um, they're going to inform your decisions of uh, whether or not to provide services to a client beyond uh, just advice. Um, but I think that they are a great starting point. And then there may be uh, a lot more um, to consider when making that determination. Um, so, I mean, first of all, does the client have a meritorious case and realistic goals and expectations? Um, I mean, that's just the baseline. Um, but I would, for me at least, it's it's necessary. <laughs> Um, you know, I don't think, first of all, that you can analyze, uh, whether the case is meritorious without, uh, realist, whether the goals are realistic also factoring in because, you know, the client may be in a situation, for instance, where they've been, uh, recently, uh, released from prison and they want to start visiting with the child again, um, and if they are looking to start with supervised visits and expand from there, um, that is a realistic goal. And I think that makes their case meritorious. Um, if they are seeking to obtain primary custody right now, um, then not so realistic and then maybe not a meritorious case. Um, now, as the attorney, it is to some extent our job to um, to try to temper our clients' expectations, um, and we did discuss that um, already to some extent. But I do think that we've all experienced situations, um, regardless of our primary area of practice, where um, clients just don't want to hear it right, where they have very unrealistic expectations and cannot be persuaded um, that they are not likely to, um, not likely to prevail in what they are seeking. Um, so there's only so much you can do. Um, and you probably don't want to be fighting that losing battle with the client. Um, throughout uh, represent, representing them, um, and especially where um, taking on a case for custody can turn out to be longer term um, and more time consuming than perhaps certain other types of proceedings. Um, you do want to be careful um, that you're taking on a case that actually has merit. Um, and you, of course, you want to consider whether representation is likely to affect the outcome. Um, I know that it can sometimes be tempting to take the really good cases <laughs> um, where the client does have a, a very meritorious case. Um, and a very strong argument to get all of the things that they want. Um, but in those cases, you also have to ask, um, is representing them going to actually change anything? Or do they have such a strong case that they're almost certainly going to win regardless? Um, and having an attorney with them is really not going to make a difference one way or the other. Um, and uh, the same the same can be true if it's a, a very bad case, right? Where you can represent them and do um, really great work, but sometimes you just have bad facts um, and there's nothing that you can do at this stage in the game to, by way of, you know, representing the client or making legal arguments that's going to change the outcome because there's just these bad facts. Um, and in those cases, it probably makes more sense to advise the client about um, 
you know, how, how to get from where they are now into a situation where um, they might have um, a stronger case, a better shot at getting what they're asking for. Um, I don't know. Um, I would like to, I hope that when I open this up for questions, that maybe one or two of you can provide some uh, feedback or experiences regarding that. Um, there is also, um, there are also some situations where just drafting a document for a client to file um, as a pro se litigant can uh, be all that they need. Um, and I think that this is especially a, a really good example of this that does tend to come up quite a bit um, is a petition to intervene. So um, there are pro se forms um, for most things in custody, um, but most counties do not seem to have um, a petition to intervene for that a pro se litigant can, you know, fill in the blanks and file um, to intervene in a custody action. And it's really just not something that I think most non-lawyers would be able to figure out how to draft. Um, that being said, uh, the argument as to whether that party has standing to intervene in the case is really going to just rely on the facts. Um, so an attorney doesn't necessarily need to actually represent that client. They just need this, this pleading, this basically piece of paper to get them before the court so that they can explain the facts to the court uh, that gives them standing. So um, there are situations where, you know, you might not need to represent the client, but you might be able to do something beyond just advice that um, makes a big difference. Um, and there are also situations where it might be beneficial um, if, especially if the client is um, headed towards just a conciliation conference, um, or perhaps even a hearing if it's on a narrow issue. Um, sometimes it can be helpful um, to reach out to opposing counsel on the client's behalf uh, to see if any kind of uh, agreement can be reached prior to going to court. Um, obviously this is limited to situations where there's counsel on the other side, um, but I have done that before with sometimes pretty good results. Um, Occasionally, um, you might be able to uh, obtain a, a stipulation um, and resolve an issue without the need for a hearing or conference to even occur. Um, and then um, you'll also want to cons consider capacity. Um, and that really breaks down to a few separate things. Um, one is your current caseload, um, you know, and whether you have the capacity to take anything else on right now. Um, a second consideration is on the other side of it, um, what kind of time commitment will this particular case require of you? Um, and you'll have to keep in mind that, um, you know, you you want to make sure that you're going to be very specific with the client about um, if you are providing representation, what that's going to entail. Um, you know, perhaps they're only headed for a, uh, a conciliation conference um, and you're willing to provide representation at that stage. Um, but it may go to a trial after that and, and you don't know if you can do a trial. Um, and so you would have to be clear with with the client if you wanted to provide that sort of limited representation um, that you're not taking on their case indefinitely. Um, and depending on how your courts are, you may want to make it very clear to them as well. Um, you may have a client that you want to represent who is headed directly for trial. 
um, or you want to, you know, you think it's a, a case that has a lot of merit um, and meets your organization's priorities um, and you like to stay on it until the point of trial. Um, but that is a huge time commitment. Um, and also, you may be committing yourself to um, to something that isn't going to occur for several months and you don't even know what your schedule will be like at that point. So these are all considerations. Um, and finally, there's emotional capacity. And um, one of my colleagues um, who's actually on here, so I'm going to sing them out now, um, Stephen Fernando pointed out to me once that um, uh, the cases that we deal with are sometimes, you know, highly emotionally charged and um, having the emotional capacity to handle a case, um, you know, sometimes nearing burnout really is an issue of capacity. Um, and so that's something that we want to consider as well, um, especially if it is a case that um, eh, eh, uh, triggers certain um, emotions in us, or if we um, are already dealing with a lot of cases that um, that we may sometimes become too emotionally invested in. Um, but I would like to hear um, from other people uh, on the call from other advocates, if anyone has any feedback regarding um, things that they consider um, when determining the scope of services in a custody case. Or not. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, or insights? Does anybody? Um... Diane. Yes. I'm sorry, I was muted. And... Oh, okay. Yeah. Had three o'clock brain. <laughs> um, one of the things that I do sometimes consider when determining the scope of services is whether or not the client themselves has the, <clears throat> there's no polite way to say this, the mental capacity to handle going into court and effectively or even pseudo effectively communicating what it is that they're looking for and what the problem is. Because a lot of times they'll shoot themselves in the foot with the judge if they go in and they start talking about stuff that occurred five years ago mixed in with what happened yeah. last week. Mm -hmm. And they're an emotional mess and they're and they get themselves in trouble. So yeah. I'll, I'll assess how is this person's, you know, mental and emotional status in just sometimes it's a simple, you know, we'll go in, we'll present this. They're saying they agree. There might be a couple things that are, you know, not nailed down, go in, give it to the judge and say, here's the problem. Here's the, here's the offer. They've dug in. We don't know why. And let the judge take it. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. Actually, and actually, I thought that was on my outline. So I don't know why it didn't make it onto the slide. Um, but I absolutely agree there. Sometimes, you know, whether because of uh, mental health issues or an intellectual disability of some kind, um, or just communication issues generally, some clients may not be able to effectively advocate for themselves. Um, and I, I do agree that that's a very important situation. And I think, it, and it kind of ties in with that, um, especially when it comes to the, like the emotional side of it, that um, if it's a, if the client is a victim of domestic violence and the other party is their abuser, um, you know, I think that's another factor that can um, affect their ability to effectively advocate for themselves um and and just make that a lot more difficult for them um anybody else um so i know a lot of times a lot of people don't like to um ask questions um 
or um, contribute comments in front of everyone else. Um, so uh, I welcome um, after um, after the presentation is finished, if anybody wants to reach out to me on an individual basis, you can call or email. Um, I will add my information to the bottom of this slide before sending it to be um, sent out to all of you, um, but I am gonna distribute the slides. I'm hoping that they will be uh, a useful reference uh, for everybody in the future, um, but that's all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Diane. Thank you for everybody for attending. Thanks, Diane. Thanks. <laughs>